uninhibited imaginations, creativity and hyperfocus in ADHD, in partnership with the U of M Department of Psychology. So I'm going to be talking about some of um, my research on uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And as you are probably aware, it's a common childhood disorder um, with characteristics of inattentiveness, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. And it commonly persists into adulthood in a little bit less than half of the people that are diagnosed with, as children. So the incidence of ADHD has been going up over time. So this is just um, some data from 2003 to 2011, but um, the most recent data out there is about 11.4, 11.5% of children in the United States are diagnosed with ADHD um, and um, persists into adulthood in about 4% of the population. So a little bit less than half of the people that have um, ADHD as children. Um, so ADHD has lots of potentially negative consequences for all kinds of activities in the real world. So for example, kids with ADHD often have academic difficulties due to their poor self-regulation. They're often distractible, have difficulties with social situations and work situations. But um, here I'm going to talk a little bit about the flip side. So to the extent to which um, ADHD symptomology might actually have some benefits for everyday activities. Um, so it's sort of an example of a classic character with ADHD um, is Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, so I've got a great idea for school tomorrow. I cut a ping pong ball in half and now I'm drawing dots on each end. I'll just put one over each eye and it will look like I'm really paying attention. Or will I look too interested? <laughs> um, so this is an example of someone who both has difficulty with attention, but comes up with a creative solution in order to solve his attentional difficulties. So, so first I'm gonna start with a little bit of background. Attention is limited. So all of us have highly at limited attentional resources. You can only pay attention to very little information at a time and be conscious of even less of that information. So we prioritize what we're supposed to be focusing on by filtering out irrelevant information. So for example, um, you might have thoughts in your head that you might not be, wanna think about right now, like, oh, well, tonight I could have been at the Oberon launch, but I'm here instead. Or you could be thinking about um, things in the external environment or um, thinking about um, the tasks that you're doing, which is listening to this presentation. So um, what does that is a sort of attentional system that controls and regulates what it is that you're paying attention to. And um, you can kind of vary the breadth of this attentional system by controlling what it is you're paying attention to. So you could pay attention to something quite narrow, just really laser focus in on a task, or you could be focused um, more broadly, sort of what's going on in the world, what's over here, what's over there, and so on. So um, the modulation of attention um, is crucial for many tasks. So you have to be able to filter out irrelevant information and use what limited capacity you have to be conscious and think of the things that are important for the task that you're doing. And so you have to be able to inhibit irrelevant information and distractions and attend to important new and different information as the task demands. Um, and the system that does that, um, it incorporates a lot of um, processes. And some of these involve, for example, filtering irrelevant information. And this is just a task that we often use in the lab to measure the ability to filter information. And in this task, all you have to do is look at a screen and judge whether the little arrow is pointing to the left or to the right. And the crucial thing about this task is that there are arrows surrounding it that are either the same as or different from the one in the center. And it's a very subtle effect, but it takes a little bit more time to answer whether the arrow in the middle is pointing left or right when the things that are flanking it, so it's called the flanker task, things that are flanker, flanking it are going in the opposite direction. So this ability to filter information um, might be relevant to all kinds of things in a school context. So for example, um, a child might be humming next to you while you're trying to take a test, um, or a 
somebody's light up sneakers look so appealing while you're looking at instead of you're supposed to be um, paying attention to the teacher telling you a story for adults it might be loud music in the car next to you distracting you from um, the left turn you're about to make so you forget to use your turn signal things like that so um, another kind of distraction that we have so this is kind of external distraction stuff out there that is distracting you from what your primary goal is um, you're also um, dealing with internal distractions. So those might be things like what, thinking about what you had for breakfast today or where you're going tonight or whether you remembered to bring your coat, you know, something like that, things that are going on in your head um, while you're supposed to be doing something else. And so a way that we measure that type of distraction um, is a task like this where you first see an object, then you might see four letters, and then you have to say whether the letter that you saw is included in the set of letters that you saw previously. Well, that's not so hard if you do it once, but if you do it over and over and over again, and sometimes there's an A in the set and sometimes there's not an A in the set, um, you start forgetting which time it was that you saw the A in the set. So your own prior sort of thinking about the letter A makes it hard to avoid thinking that you saw the letter A. So that's another kind of distraction um, that we measure in the laboratory. And individuals with ADHD actually are slower and less accurate at both of these kinds of tasks that I just described than people who don't have ADHD. And this is sort of akin to thinking about last night's basketball game. Um, I was really happy that Duke lost. I'm I guess I shouldn't say that, um, <laughs> but, um, but thinking about last night's basketball game um, instead of um, studying for the math test is an example of that. So in ADHD, um, individuals with ADHD often have less control over whether they're thinking broadly or narrowly at the times where maybe they're supposed to be in, say, a school context. So having a wide focus might involve things like too much attention distracted by things outside the intended area of focus. So thinking about things that you're not supposed to be thinking about, paying attention to things in the environment that you're not supposed to be thinking about. And um, the problem with that is that you may not be attending to the tasks that you're supposed to, like reading comprehension or math. But there could be something positive about that. So thinking about things that you're not supposed to be thinking about sometimes leads to the serendipitous connection between different ideas or generating ideas that are much more distant ideas than maybe other people might think of and lead to creative achievement. Um, likewise, sometimes if you can't stop yourself from a laser-like focus, that's often um, a negative, so it's paying attention to one thing at the expense of anything else. And you can lose track of time or obligations. If you're working on a painting um, because you're an artist and you really focus on your work, you may forget to get up and go to the bathroom or you might um, forget or not want to stop when you're supposed to get up and make dinner for your family, things like that. But again, this hyper-focus may have some positive consequences for creative achievement and other activities. So the question that we ask in some of our work is the extent to which um, people with ADHD, despite limitations and perhaps in spite or because of these limitations in an inhibition and attentional control might show greater creativity and we ask what aspects of creativity, is it all aspects of the creative process? Um, and what we find is that they really benefit only on some aspects of creativity, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by divergent thinking versus more convergent creativity. Um, and also we find that we can explain this advantage based on limitations and attentional control. And that, yes, in fact, it does lead to real life um, improvements or benefits in creative achievement and um, applies to children as well as adults. Um, the other area of research I'm going to talk about is research on hyper focus. So there's a lot of um, popular press about the fact that 
people with ADHD sometimes show intense focus on things that they're especially motivated by, but it turns out that there's virtually no research on this topic, and so we've done some interesting new studies on this topic, and I'm going to tell you about that, and one of the things that we'll ask is whether it's across the board or if it's in just some domains. Um, for example, there's already evidence that there's intent, um, likely internet addiction, screen time, things like that. So is it just unproductive domains or can it happen in more productive domains? Um, and we'll also ask if it's related to related constructs like flow, this sort of intense engagement in some kind of activity that you might be interested in, or addictive behaviors. All right, so I'm gonna start by talking about the link between inhibition, ADHD, and creativity. And in the past, two links have been pretty definitively established. So one is that ADHD is associated with poor inhibition or poor attentional control. And further, that inhibition itself, less inhibition often leads to enhanced creativity. So based on that, already done research, we thought, well, it's clear that we can draw the line from um, a diagnosis of ADHD to less inhibition and then perhaps to greater creative achievement. Um, and in particular, we thought that this poor inhibition might benefit what we call divergent thinking, the ability to generate many ideas from one um, idea. Basically, what you're doing when you brainstorm or generate ideas for new things, things like that. All right, and a classic measure of this is the unusual uses test. And an example is, how many uses can you think of for a brick? So it could be break a window, use as a doorstop, use as a paperweight, and so forth. And we just asked participants in our study to list, literally, how many things they can think of um, to do with a brick. Um, convergent thinking, on the other hand, is the ability to generate one idea that many separate ideas or concepts share, it's sort of pulling together ideas. And one way in which that's measured is uh, the remote associates test. So for example, if you see these three words, falling, actor, and dust, can you think of a word that's associated with all three of these words? Eric. Very good. <laughs> Coin quick spoon. Anyone want to try that one? Great. Bald screech emblem. Note dive chair. High, high note, high dive, high chair. Um. <laughs> so, um, both divergent and convergent thinking laboratory measures are correlated with real life thinking, um, creativity. Um, and some models of creativity argue that you probably need both. So you need to have some convergent thinking, say when you're coming up with lots of different ideas and trying to generate, um, invent something new, but then you need some convergence and focus as you're developing the idea further, things like that. All right. So in this first study I'm gonna tell you about, it was done with Holly White, who's right over there. Um, it, we had 45 ADHD and 45 non-ADHD adults. Um, these were all college students. Um, and they did an inhibition task, like one of the ones that I showed you before. Um, a divergent thinking task, a convergent thinking task, um, the unusual uses in the remote associates, the ones I already showed you, and then some ADHD skills to confirm their diagnosis their diagnosis of ADHD. And we had them do brick, how many uses can you think of for a brick, a bucket, and a bucket. And for each item, three scores are calculated. Um, I should add that we actually, for a while, were using clothespin, but young people don't know what clothespins are. Um, so we couldn't use that one. Um, so we had fluency, which is the number of distinct responses that people gave. So how many ideas can they generate? but also originality, how original are the ideas that they're generating, and flexibility. Do you kind of come up with lots of ideas that are in one category, like um, containers, like hold flowers, hold water, et cetera, for a bucket, or um, different categories, like headgear, weapons, containers? Um, and what we found was that people 
with ADHD, so that's the light blue compared to the non-ADHD individuals, um, actually showed greater divergent thinking on the measures of fluency, originality, and flexibility. Um, and here's some sample ex responses. So these are unoriginal responses. Like a typical response for brick would be things like building a house or building a wall. A typical example for bucket, carrying water, making a sandcastle. These are the kinds of things our ADHDs came up with. Crush and make into lipstick. Use on surfaces like concrete. Use as a pencil holder. As a guitar if strings and a stick are added. As an underwater air supply. Draw a face on it, put a leash on it, and keep it as a pet. So you can see that these are quite different in the way that they um, are thought of. But it turns out that ADHDs weren't better at every single task that we gave them. So they were, in particular, actually less good at the convergent thinking measure that we gave them. And um, so they performed worse on the inhibition test, as we expected. Um, and they outperformed non-ADHDs on the divergent thinking measure. Um, and but non-ADHDs were better on the convergent thinking measure. And furthermore, um, inhibition, the ability to inhibit irrelevant information, um, actually mediated or explained those findings to large extent. So in other words, having poor inhibition means that your mind is thinking more broadly and leads to these effects. OK, so you might say, well, these are just laboratory tasks of creativity. What about achievement in the real world? So in our next study, what we did was we gave people the creative achievement questionnaire. And um, it measures lifetime achievement in art and science. So they range for every domain, like visual arts. I have no training or talent. I've taken lessons. People have commented on my talent. I've won a prize. I've had a showing of my work in a gallery. I've sold a piece of my work been critiqued in local or national publications. So for every category, we had um, people rate their achievement in these different domains. And we wanted to see if, um, at these different levels, we wanted to see if people with ADHD actually had greater creative achievement. Um, we also used a second real life measure that was called the foresight thinking profile. And it addresses basically three cre four creative thinking modes, idea clarification, idea generation, idea development and idea implementation. So um, they asked questions like, I like to break a broad problem apart to examine it from all angles. I enjoy working on ill-defined novel problems. Or I like to focus on creating a precisely stated problem. I really enjoy implementing ideas. So you can see how that kind of gets at different aspects of creative achievements. And um, people get a score on each kind of thinking style. So this had 28 ADHD and non-ADHD um, adults. And they also took a standardized measure of creativity called the uh, Torrance Test of Creativity. And it has questions like, make pictures in this bunch of triangles that you see. And so you might draw a pizza in one of the triangles. You might make a hat out of one of the triangles. And verbal fluency, thinking about what the consequences could be, would be if you could fly without an airplane. Um, and then they did the creative achievement questionnaire and the foresight questionnaire. And what we found here is that people with ADHD on the Torrance test, the standardized measure of creativity, basically did best on the originality measure, um, but not the other measure. So their responses were more original than the responses of the non-ADHD measures. Now, the reason that they don't give different numbers of responses is because they're all given the same number of triangles, say, to draw in. So they're, they're not going to have differences in fluency because they're doing the tasks we've told them to do. Um, people with ADHD are actually worse on elaboration. So for each item that they draw, say, they put a lot less detail into each one. They're less elaborative, but they are more creative and original in what they so that's kind of an example of how there are strengths, but not, not all aspects of creativity are strengths. All right. And then on the foresight thinking profile, people with ADHD are more likely to like generating new ideas and less likely to want to develop ideas. Um, so, all right. And then finally, 
There are differences in lifetime achievement. So the things that they're good at do lead to consequences that are good. So they're more likely to have higher levels of achievement in art, science, um, performing arts, and then overall. So in general, they were better at a bunch of the different um, domains in creative achievement. Now you might say, well, first you showed me a bunch of laboratory tasks, and then you showed me some self-report measures. Maybe the creative people, the ADHDs, think they're more creative and successful. So we finally did one more study I'm going to tell you about. Um, all right, so let me first actually tell you. So ADHDs are better than um, non-ADHDs on originality, um, and they have greater creative achievement scores even in college. And ADHDs report that they prefer and excel at some aspects of creative thinking, like idea generation, but not at others. Um, and so, like I said, could this be because individuals with ADHD are less inhibited about reporting their creative achievements, or are they really more creative? Um, so finally, if inhibition doesn't fully explain the differences in divergent thinking, so I, d I didn't sort of go into depth on this subtle issue of inhibition not fully explaining why the people with ADHD were um, better at various divergent thinking measures, um, we thought that there might be another explanation. So we tested that. So in this study, we actually decided to use a real life measure of creativity that we actually got from a paper by one of our colleagues, Fiona Lee, um, which was to design a better cell phone test, cell phone for college students. Um, and we scored the cell phones that they invented. And I would just like to say that this was several years ago, so cell phones weren't quite as advanced as they are now when we were doing this. But, um, but anyways, we scored based on originality and innovativeness, which was literally measured based on the technology that was available at the moment that they did this task, and practicality. So we had 30 ADHDs and not 30 non-ADHDs. They did the cell phone task. Then they did the word association task, just because I thought I've been a psychology professor for quite a few years and I've never done this task, which is what is the first word that comes in mind when I say blah? Like, what is the first word that comes in mind when I say table? All right, yeah, so that's basically the task. And what we can do is we can measure the distance between the semantic distance or the meaning distance between words that you report. So chair and table are closely connected. So they get a tight connection and the way that we do this mathematically is by corpus analysis. So we know tons and tons and tons of text and then we know that table and chair occur sim frequently together. And so they're more similar. But let's say when you said table, you said plate, right? Plate sometimes co-occurs with table, like you're setting the table and you put the plate on the table. But it's not as common an associate. So the idea here would be to measure how semantically distant the words that the first come to mind to someone. All right, and here's what we found. We found that the ADHDs were more innovative based on current technology. Um, and non-ADHD um, provided interventions that were more practical. So they were ADHDs were more original and more pra uh, more innovative, and I think it wasn't actually significantly less practical. Um, yeah. All right. So here's some non things that were rated as non-innovative like cell phone that has a large font, cell phone with an alarm clock built in. Um, innovative, cell phone that has an alarm clock that only turns off when slowly moved 20 feet, so you can't throw it, but you must step out of bed. Um, all right, and then what we found is the distance between the words that they generated um, was correlated with how innovative and original um, their responses were. So if, if you just, if we said table and you said plate or napkin instead of chair, then you are actually also more likely to be someone who developed an original or innovative idea there. So we found that ADHD adults are more innovative than non-ADHD adults on an in invention task. 
And the word association performance was related to their innovativeness and originality. Um, I'm just gonna tell you that this applies not just for adults, but for children as well. So others have done studies with children. And here's an example of a study um, of storytelling. Boys with ADHD produced stories that were higher in novelty than originality compared to their non-ADHD peers. Um, and then on a figural Torrance test of creative thinking, the ADHD children created more original and diverse designs than those of their non-ADHD peers. And adolescents showed higher creativity than non-ADHD peers on a task that required them to invent new toys without using elements of the examples provided. So they were given some example toys and said, invent a new toy, but it shouldn't look anything like the one we gave you. And um, it's really hard for people who don't have ADHD kind of to step away from the constraints of the toy that they're given as an example and come up with something that's distinct. All right. And then finally, I'm gonna tell you, so I told you a lot about our research on creativity and ADHD, and I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to talk about some recent studies that we've done on hyperfocus. And like I said, there's a lot of self-report out there in the media that there is greater hyperfocus with individuals with ADHD, and we know that ADHDs have difficulty on certain tasks that might be related to hyperfocus, like switching their attention from one thing to another. Um, but um, so we developed a hyperfocus scale based on clinician descriptions as well as in um, interviews with ADHD individuals. And we created questions that were not just, they were general, but also topic specific. So hyper-focus in a school context, in a hobby context, and in screen time context. And we examined the degree of hyper-focus and severity of ADHD symptoms, as well as flow and internet addiction, because these are related ideas that we wanted to distinguish from hyper-focus. And so here's some sample items from our hyper-focus scale. Generally, when I'm very focused on something or doing something that I find especially rewarding, I might accidentally oops, skip meals, stay up all night, or keep doing the activity until I absolutely must get up to go to the bathroom. And I don't, nowadays, my issue is I do it until my knees are locked. <laughs> and then I try to get up and like slowly make my way to the bathroom. Um, so. In general, when I'm busy doing something I enjoy or something that I'm very focused on, I find it very difficult to quit and move on to something, doing something else, even if I have a lot of other important things I should be doing instead. Or generally, when I'm very focused on something or doing something that I find especially rewarding, I can feel totally captivated by or hooked on an activity. And so I want you to note that these things are not necessarily positive or negative. They can be positive in certain situations. So being captivated and hooked on an activity could lead you to you know, write your novel, but it could also lead um, to negative consequences like forgetting to show up on time to your job. So they're both, they're trade-offs to this particular, these particular um, characteristics. So I'm gonna tell you about four, two different studies and in both of the studies, participants filled out scales for a variety of mental health diagnoses. We didn't want them to know that we were asking about ADHD and hyperfocus per se, because they might have some sorts of prior beliefs about what we were looking for or what we would expect. Um, they also did our hyperfocus scale um, and then a flow scale. And flow is kind of intense immersion that's usually enjoyable in some kind of activity that you love, like when you're practicing guitar, um, things like that. Um, so it's kind of a related idea. And there were some flow scales out there. Um, and then internet addiction, which is um, something that we know that ADHDs often have um, and also might be related to this idea of hyperfocus. So the first study, we just randomly sampled um, close to 300 people, uh, about 23 of whom had ADHD. So this was just, we got everyone, and we assessed ADHD symptoms on a continuous scale. And then in the second study, we actually um, first assessed 3,000 people, and then we found the 
200 or so that had ADHD from that 3,000, and we invited them to participate in the study, and then a random sample of the additional 3,000 people who did not have ADHD. So this time, we had a larger number of ADHDs um, because we oversampled for ADHD. And what we found here is that the people with um, ADHD, um, this is the first study, showed higher levels of hyperfocus in school context even, often on the subject that they were excited about or interested in, um, hobbies, screen time, and overall. So we found effects of ADHD on all of these. And then in our replication sample, we again found that people with ADHD were more likely to be hyper-focused in school, hobbies, um, on screen time, and in general. So um, these, um, I'm gonna show you one more bit of data. Um, this is everyone in that second study. Um, and across the x-axis is their hyper-focus score. And this is the severity of their ADHD um, on the Connors Adult ADHD rating scale. And what you find here is these are the people with ADHD and these are the people who don't have ADHD. So even for the people that don't have ADHD, the more hyper-focused they um, were, the, more, the closer they were to sort of having ADHD on this self-report scale of ADHD. And then the people with ADHD were higher on hyper-focus across the board. Um, and then I guess the, the other thing I should tell you is that it didn't relate to any other mental health diagnoses that we asked about. However, people who had depression and ADHD were most likely to show hyperfocus, and the people who um, so that com combination led to the greatest amount of hyperfocus. Um, so here, I've basically given you some systematic evidence for creative differences in ADHD and non-ADHD individuals than previously reported. Um, and, oops, ADHD individuals don't perform better on all aspects of creativity. It's really the divergent brainstorming idea generation aspects of creativity. But nonetheless, they have impact on real life, um, both creative achievement measures, but also on our cell phone invention task, which is, a, I think, a really nice example of a task that's um, kind of realistic and not just a laboratory task and not just a self-report task. Um, and then that ADHD individuals um, show greater rates of hyper-focus than non-ADHD individuals. So um, I wanted to thank you all for coming. And Holly, who's here, has worked with me on the creativity work and has continued to do research on that. So she could probably answer more questions about that. And then um, the hyper-focus work was done with two PhD students um, in, at Michigan, Kathleen Hupfeld and Tessa Abagis. And we've had lots of research assistants coding all of the different materials that our participants have generated in their studies. So thank you all for coming. This program was recorded on March 26th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.